Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, we are just going to wait a couple of minutes to give people some time to join. And um, the webinar will be in and training session will be in English, but we have um, interpretation, live interpretation into French and Portuguese. Um, and if you would like to listen in either of these languages, you can access the interpretation by clicking on the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and choosing the language. Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for this com Conversations with CAMSA webinar. Um, and we will be starting shortly. Just another reminder that the webinar will be in English um, and the training will be in English, but we are live interpreting it into English, sorry, into Portuguese and French. And if you would prefer to listen in one of these languages, you can do so by selecting the interpretation option at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will now hand over to my colleague, Kate, Kate Strawn, to um, introduce us to the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thanks, Nicola. And it's really great to be here. Um, as Nicola mentioned, I'm Kate Strawn, and I'm the coordinator of the Comsa Secretariat, which is hosted by Italy Africa. I hope everyone can see my screen. I'm just going to make it into a little bit bigger. Nicola, can you give me a nod when you can see my screen? I can see your screen, Kate. Brilliant. Um, um, it's just the presentation is loading. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, for some reason, it's not. Let me know if the presentations come up. From my side, I'm still just seeing a blank screen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's see. There we go. I can see that now. Oh, brilliant. Okay. So, there, so um, as Nicola said, I'll just introduce the Covenant of Mayor Sub-Saharan Africa 
which is a European Union action that supports the external dimension of the European Green Deal. At the same time, COMSA moves to strengthen the African-EU partnership and supports Agenda 2063 of the African Union Commission. COMSA is co-funded by the European Commission, the European Union, um, BMZ and ACID. And our sincere thanks goes to them for making this session possible. COMSA is a major catalyst for local climate action in the region with political commitment from over 280 governments currently. One of the main objectives of COMSA is to support subnational and local governments in the provision of and transition to sustainable energy access and in furthering their climate change journeys. COMSA has been pioneering this work since 2015 and during this time we have been growing an um, acknowledgement of how vital local action is in achieving climate ambition. And as you can see we currently are present in 37 countries and our reach is over 137 million people. We also provide all our technical services and communications in three languages, French, English and Portuguese. Um, as mentioned, we're looking at supporting our, our signatories in their journey, which also is what we call the CACAP journey, our Sustainable Energy Access Climate Action Planning journey, which has three pillars, a mitigation pathway, an adaptation pathway, and access to energy pathway. The COMSA Technical Help Desk provides technical support in, in all three fields of sustainable energy access, climate change adaptation, and as well as looking at access to finance. Our support covers this entire journey from the development of scientifically rigorous baseline studies, target setting and action planning and project conceptualization to the prioritization and early stage development of your projects. And I'm really excited about today's workshop as we unpack target setting, um, specifically linked to mitigation. And science-based targets provide a clearly defined pathway for cities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in line with the latest climate science and the goals of the Paris Agreement. By setting such targets, cities help to prevent the worst impacts of climate change, proof, future-proof development, and contribute to the efforts to limit warm, warming of 1.5 degrees. Today's training will introduce science-based targets, methods that can be used for setting these targets in African cities, and the application of these methods to develop your targets. The session will also cover how the target setting process aligns with climate action planning processes within your local governments, including the development of sustainable energy access, access and climate action plans, which, as I mentioned, known as your CACAP and the COMSA. And I think Nicola, at the end of the webinar, will provide you with more details on how the COMSA Technical Help Desk can support your city with aspects of your CACAP journey. I hope everyone enjoys today's webinar and that this provides you with the tools and the capabilities to go back to your city and start your journey, your CACAP journey. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you very much, Kate, for that introduction to um, Kamsa. And just a reminder to everybody, if you for any questions, comments, please use the chat and we will try to address any technical issues as they come up, if there are any. Um, I would now like to introduce the training session on science-based targets, which will be delivered by one of our colleagues from the ICLE World Secretariat. And Carla Mourinho is a climate data officer at the ICLE World Secretariat, which is located in Bonn, in Germany. She is an environmental engineer and urban greenhouse gas inventory specialist. And Carla is part of the team that drives validation of climate science-based targets for cities. So she knows the content that she'll be delivering today very well and is a, an excellent person to give us this training session. Um, and she conducts data analysis on greenhouse gas inventories and other climate-related data that is reported to the CDP ECLI Unified Reporting System, which is we'll be mentioning later in the session as well. Um, and Further Carla is also involved in measuring reporting and 
verification of greenhouse gas emissions and actions at some national level. So she's very much involved in city climate change mitigation work and in greenhouse gas inventories and target setting. And so I would now like to hand over to Carla for the training session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen. Okay, I think you should be able to see it. Yep. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so um, thank you very much for that introduction, Nicola, and welcome everyone. Um, and thanks for being with us today for this training. I hope that we can um, pass some learnings that we have had to you. Um, so this is what we are going to be um, learning and discussing about today. So first, I'm going to make a, a small introduction of, of the scheme of the frames that are around the knowledge that we will be sharing with you. Um, then we are going to be looking into specifically what are science-based targets. So what is the agreement on that? Um, then why are they relevant for cities at all? Um, that will be the first part of the session. Um, and then we are going to go um, straight into the methodological approaches. Um, and we are going to be seeing the different methods available and comparing in terms of their usability. So lastly, we are going to be looking at a summary just with the, with the methods that I will be going through today. Um, and I think the questions will be done through the chat, so I'll just be attentive to that. But yeah, please let me know if, if anything, okay? Okay, so as an introduction, I would like to start with um, this, the Science-Based Targets Network. This is a network of 50 plus organizations which are collaborating to develop tools and approaches, not only for cities, but also for businesses, um, because they want to promote the adoption of science-based targets, and then not only for climate, but for all Earth systems. So that includes climate, water, land, oceans, and biodiversity. So um, here what you're seeing is the group of the partners who are present um, for the science-based target discussions which are happening around cities. And so here we have C40, CDP, the GCOM, we have WWF, we have ICLOI, ICLOI um, WRI. So those are the partners who are now discussing about the work that's done in regards to cities specifically. And I have to say, um, that for the private sector, this is already something that is developed, but for cities, this is started and we are uh, all together trying to put a frame for very accurately and robustly validate and check science-based targets from cities, all the way from commitment to implementation and monitoring. So uh, zooming a little bit into the cities, um, into the cities arena, so we have some works that have been developed by, the, by these core city partners. And here, um, well, first of all, they have developed core principles on what science-based targets, science-based climate targets, sorry, for cities mean. And more than develop these core principles is kind of pulling up together all, all the studies that have been available and making an agreement on that. Um, also, this group has evaluated the existing methods on science-based targets for cities. And result of that assessment or evaluation, a guide has been produced to, pro to provide support to cities to set their science-based targets for climate. So that's a little bit of the background. Um, so this is a technical body composed by different partners. And yes, then we have the races, the race to zero, for example, and then the Cities Race to Zero, which is the initiative for cities, um, which is the initiative that promotes the adoption of these kind of targets. So what you are going to be seeing today is the knowledge that has been sort of uh, produced by these partners. Okay, so let's start um, in the beginning. What are science-based targets? What we have agreed um, in, in this frame is that they are measurable, actionable, and time-bound objectives that allow cities' actions to be aligned with Earth's, Earth's limits and societal sustainability goals. 
So looking further then to climate, um, climate science-based targets, those are measurable and actionable targets which are aligned with the, par with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, so the methods that we are going to be looking at today are specific for climate and specific for, city, for cities. So here we have um, some considerations of a science-based target. Um, a city climate science-based target is an emission reduction target which covers community-wide emissions. That means all the sectors in your greenhouse gas inventory, not only local government operations or corporate emissions, they have this name in some places, but basically it's just all sectors of the economy. Um, that's that's one aspect of it. Then we also have that these type of targets, they align with a 1.5 pathway. And th this is why we have the methods which help us to determine how ambitious my target should be so that I'm doing my part to, to achieve uh, the goal of staying below the target temperature. And then this brings us to our third component. This target represents a fair share of global emission reductions. And here um, we can make reference to the Paris Agreement, common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in the light of different national circumstances. So this is one very critical component of science-based targets, the understanding that um, according to the different contexts, uh, there will be different capabilities and also different responsibilities in terms of past emissions. So these methods that I will be showing you today, they each have different approaches to exactly um, address this fair share approach. Some of them consider emissions and some of them consider other indicators which they consider appropriate and science-based to define a fair share of, of contribution by a subnational actor. Um, a city climate science-based target and that you will see later includes a net zero target in 2050 and an interim target to achieve within the next decade, so by 2030. So those are, um, those are the most important considerations of a science-based target. And now I want to um, speak a little bit about why they are relevant for cities. Well, I think this is already very known, I think, to most of us. Cities are responsible for 75% of energy-related global emissions. So we really have a major role to play in achieving net zero emissions. We need to cut greenhouse gas emissions quickly enough if we want to uh, achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and then there is another thing. Some cities already have science-based targets, but they might not be aware of this. So by joining the race to zero um, and, and the city's race to zero, the cities will be able to check if their, if their target is a science-based target that is in line with the latest science and that it represents a fair share. Um, and lastly, um, science-based targets, yeah, as I mentioned, they are a core element of, of this campaign. So when the city has one of these targets, they, they can meet and, and they can be showcased at the international level. Okay, so now a little bit into the principles of science-based targets. And I would like just to look into these three elements um, for now. So science-driven, what does it mean that they are science-driven? Um, it means that they are here to what science is telling us and what science told us in the 1.5 degree re uh, special report is that we need to more or less halve our emissions by 2030 with baseline from what our from what our 2010 emissions uh, were. So that's a global goal that we have. Now the question is, okay, we need to do that as a world. Now, what do I need to do that as a subnational entity? So what is my part in that goal? And that's what the methods are telling us. Equity. Take into account the different historical contributions to levels of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. So, so how much have I emitted so far? And also what is expected in the future that I will be emitting for my development, for example, from the building sector where we have a lot of emissions expected from cement. 
Um, and also, what are my capabilities um, in terms of my current socioeconomic development? And, that, and lastly, in terms of completeness, um, yeah, targets need to be complete for my for the whole boundary of my of my entity. And they look into scope one and scope two emissions. Scope one are emissions which are coming from sources which are inside my territory. And scope two emissions are emissions which are related to the grid, to energy provided through the grid. So in a nutshell. So there are other emissions which are also happening because of my city, which happen outside the city. But as of now, those are not included in these conversations of science-based targets. And another thing, a science-based target needs to have, um, needs to look into green, all the greenhouse gas emissions from the Kyoto Protocol and not only CO2 emissions. So those are the principles that have been agreed um, as of now, but I must say everything um, that this group of city network is doing so far, it's not solid in stone because it's developing and hopefully uh, it develops with science. You know, as science develops and tell us what we need to do according to our trajectories. Okay, so now I would like to talk a little bit about the assessment that was done about the methods for cities and from where we gathered all the knowledge that I will be sharing with you today. There are multiple approaches to setting science-based climate targets for cities. So these methods were researched, what existing methods there were and what do they propose? So, and then they were assessed according to different criteria. So what is their science basis? What are their equity considerations? How are they in terms of completeness? And lastly, and very important, how is their usability? So will my city be able to replicate this method and establish a science-based target with these methods? So that's what happened. And three methods were included in the guide for cities. But as we uh, continue with this work, we hope that new, new methodologies will be assessed so that we can have um, yeah, contributions from the various actors in, in, in this process. And we have better methods as well. So what we are going to be looking today, so we are already now in our session, in the second part of the session, the more um, practical part. So we are going to be looking at WWF's One Planet City Challenge method, which is the one that I think I want to highlight because it's the most uh, practical for implementation. It's a method uh, which has been tested with the One Planet City Challenge in a number of cities, previously 255, and now there is another round. And this target has an outcome of, this method, sorry, has an outcome of two targets, one in 2030 and one in 2050. So what is the target in 2030? is what this method calculates and will give us as a result. So it's a simple, straightforward approach. Um, then we have the deadline 2020, which was a study developed by C40, where they wanted to see which, um, what would be required for C40 cities and what would be their fair contribution. So that's the deadline 2020. And then they proposed reduction um, routes for different types of cities. And lastly, we have um, the Manchester University Tinder Center method, which is a method which provides annual carbon budget for CO2 emissions from the energy sector. So this method is more suitable for UK cities. It was developed uh, in that context, and it's not completely aligned to the cities race to zero because it, it only looks into CO2 emissions. And as I mentioned earlier, science-based targets, they need to include all greenhouse gas. Okay, um, so we are going to be looking at the three methods at the same time. Um, and for that, I would like that we have this, these notions of carbon budget. Um, carbon budget, it's an amount of cumulative net global anthropogenic CO2 emissions that would result in limited global warming to a given level within a given probability. So basically what we are talking about when we are speaking a carbon budget, we are speaking 
about an, an amount of emissions that can be emitted, and we can still be within the targets of the 1.5 or well below two. So that's basically a carbon budget, and we are looking at cumulative emissions um, and not only at emissions from one year. So within these three methods, we have that approach, two methods, starting from an amount that we can spend as a world. And we have another approach, with, which is just to establish two targets, which is the OPCC approach. Um, here in this graph, I just put it to show um, why the, the, the ones who are proposing carbon budgets are doing it so, because um, CO2 emissions, which even reach zero earlier, can have more CO2 emissions than, than some in some cases. For example, in here, CO2 emissions in the red scenario are 20% higher than in the blue scenario. So yeah, basically looking at cumulative emissions and not at emissions in one year only. So we have those basic uh, type of approaches within the, within the three methods for establishing science-based targets. And um, yeah, we are going to see now this in a bit detail, but I'm just going to explain to you how they work. So you don't need to understand all the details of the methods. Um, yeah, ECLE can support you in, in establishing a science-based target because we, we have been part of this process and we know how to, how to use it. So we have the One Planet City Challenge, which establishes two targets. We have one target for 2050, which is a net zero target, and that's established, so that doesn't change. And we have one target in 2030, um, which is around 50%. The baseline emissions under the OPCC are 2018. Um, so the OPCC proposes a reduction of um, more or less 50% from 2018 baseline emissions. And how they propose to include equity considerations and to define if a city target should be above 50% or below 50% and to, to which extent um, they use the human development index, which is a, a human development, um, which is an indicator at the national level. And this indicator um, has a lot of equity considerations because it's not looking only at income, for example, which is what another method does, but it's also looking at education um, and life expect expectancy. So you can look more about the human development index indicator, but for establishing a science-based target, what's important to understand is uh, that this will be the, the indicator that will define if the city needs an aggressive or a less aggressive reduction targets in 2030. So if the city is in a country which has a higher human development index, they will have to have a stronger reduction targets in 2030. And then vice versa, if they have a, a low human development index, then they will have uh, a lower reduction target below 50% in 2030. So that's, that's about the OPCC. So basically with this method, what we do is we calculate the exact reduction that's, that will be needed for 2030 for a specific city in a specific country. Um, then we have the Tinder Center method. Um, and just as a, as a sum up and, and very simple explanation of what, what this one uh, gives us, the Tinder Center defines an amount of CO2 emissions from the energy sector. And then they divide this, this amount among developed and developing countries, considering that there will be some activities that will be producing a lot of emissions. For example, uh, for cement, they allocated an amount of considerable amount of, of emissions to that to happen in the coming years. And then they divide uh, this budget per nation. How they do it? Here they include their equity considerations. They looked at past emissions of the country and the relationship to their group. And the same amount they um, allocate for the, for the country to use in the coming, the coming uh, years. And then at last, uh, they have a, a country, a budget that can be used by the country. And they deduct some 
um, emissions which are related to national mandate, for example, shipping, milita military and aviation, they take that out and the rest they divide among the different subnational entities. And then in the end, they will have an amount of CO2 emissions from energy sector that can be used by a city. And that is also done in terms of what were their past emissions. After that, they define a trajectory of reduction with a modeling exercise. So we think um, this um, method, it's more complex and it's not recommended to, to be applied by cities also because it's not, it's not complete. Um, lastly, we have the deadline 2020, which is the same principle as the Tyndall Center. So they define an amount of greenhouse gas emissions that can be emitted to stay in the target temperature. And then they define um, how this amount of, of, how this budget can be spent among cities. In their study that they did for C40 cities, they did a modeling exercise to see how they would divide that among C40 cities at the time. And they defined, and here is where they include their equity considerations. So they thought, okay, we are going to be looking into GDP per capita and uh, greenhouse gas emissions per, per capita of 2015. And we are going to, with that, build four city types. So those high emissions and high income and low uh, emissions, but still high income. And then they defined trajectories so that would reflect that. So those which have more capabilities and more emissions have to have the higher and more aggressive targets. So that's the deadline 2020. So it's also the, the principle of the carbon of the carbon budget and then how it's divided among different entities. The OPCC, in a way, it's it's also a carbon budget, but it's just for a year. It's just telling you how much a city can emit in 2030. So those are the three methods. And now we are going to go into the application so that you can have an idea of what you need to do when you would apply this method. So number one, and I guess the one that has you thinking, do I need to calculate a carbon budget just to calculate my science-based target? Um, with the OPCC, no, you don't, because that does, the, this method doesn't have this approach, so it's not applicable. With deadline 2020, although this method came from this carbon budget approach, it's not needed to calculate one because uh, this method proposes that cities choose their greenhouse gas emissions uh, profile and their GDP per capita from 2015 or rather find this data. And according to that, they um, have a trajectory that they have to follow. So a, a rate of change from their 2015 uh, baseline emissions. So with their greenhouse gas inventory, they are given a curve with just their emissions until they reach zero, and that will be their science-based targets, so a trajectory. And then within the center, yeah, cities would need to calculate not a global carbon budget, not a sub-global carbon budget, but they will need to calculate a national carbon budget unless they are in the UK, which is not the case um, with you today. Or, and also they will need to calculate their subnational carbon budget. So again, this will require a lot of capacities. Uh, so what do cities get from each of the methods? With OPCC, they will get two targets, one that you already know, and one target that will speak about an adjusted uh, reduction for, for each city. With deadline 2020, they will get a trajectory of reduction until emissions reach net, net zero in 2050. And with Tyndall Center, similarly, they'll get a trajectory of CO2 emissions from the energy sector. So this will be again incomplete. So cities will have, if cities are choosing the Tyndall Center method, which is not recommended, then they will still to have, they will still have to have target for their other sectors and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and this, this one question in comparing existing targets. So yeah, we are aware that many cities already have targets. So can I compare my existing target with using these methods to see if I already have a science-based target? So with the OPCC, cities can compare their target if this is a 2030 target. 
this is a limitation because if I have a target for another year, I cannot compare it with this method. But at the same time, when we are speaking about the science-based targets and, and, and what science is asking us, 2030 is a year of relevance because until then we need we need to already halve the, the emissions, right? So yeah, it's a limitation, but also the, the method is looking into what's relevant for science. Um, in terms of deadline 2020, CD can compare any existing targets because this method will give you a trajectory. That means it will tell you what you can emit every year until your emissions reach net zero. And within the center, the same, but only with CO2 targets from the energy sector. So again, that doesn't account for the community-wide or the city-wide target that the city requires for it to be a science-based target. Okay, so we are almost, uh, we are near finalization here. Um, and here I just wanted maybe just to remember and yeah, to see what, what you think is it's most appropriate uh, in terms of methods. So we did a testing of the methods when we were doing the assessment of the methods and we tried to understand in two, uh, in two um, aspects, how, how was it that we can use it? So we looked into accessibility of data and we look into applicability of the method. So in terms of accessibility of data, the OPCC has publicly and easily available data that is basically the human development index which is available online and with that I can already know what my city requires to reduce in 2030. So if I have my greenhouse gas emissions inventory from 2018 then I can apply that and know what my absolute emissions will, will have to be. So that's, um, that's the OPCC. In terms of deadline 2020 I need a bit more data, so I need to know my GDP per capita and my greenhouse gas emissions per capita from 2015, um, which we know sometimes is not available. And with that, I will be able to have my emissions trajectory. In regards to the Tyndall Center, I need important amount of data and some data is not publicly available and somewhat accessible. Also, some of the data is not disaggregated because this method is looking at CO2 only and greenhouse gas emission inventories are reported, including other greenhouse, gas, uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, so we have the CO2 equivalent and that includes methane, nitrous oxide and other greenhouse gases. And then some of the data is just not available for all locations other than the UK. So for example, shipping, aviation and, for, and military emissions that may not be available. In terms of applicability of the method, the OPCC, we find that we have simple operations to be conducted here, same as with the deadline 2020, but here we require the rates of reduction. And then in regards to the Tyndall Center method, we find that um, although the, the operations are not uh, very complex, they still require, they are many, and so this might bring you to, to errors, no? And of course, this will need a lot of capacities. And then in the cases when you don't have data, there might be assumptions that we as testers did. And so this also might, might lead to, to mistakes. So final remarks on each of the methods. OPCC will not give you trajectories uh, and it's compar it's, their comparability is uh, limited but it's looking into 2030 targets, which are relevant for the discussions on science-based. Deadline 2020, they, it will give you trajectories of reduction, but we have to work with these rates, um, which are more appropriate for C40 cities, I would say, because C40 is working uh, with, uh, with these cities, so they might have access to that. And then in terms of the Tinder Center, this is only looking into CO2 energy emissions. And uh, yeah, there is limited comparability with existing city targets. Um, so just a little bit on, okay, I have, I know now what my science-based target is because I chose the OPCC method. So I know now what I need to reduce in 2030. Uh, in order to make that impactful, I should report that in the CDP K25 reporting system. 
um, in the previous year in 2021, and under the Race to Zero, which I, I mentioned is the initiative, the umbrella initiative, cities reported the information they had, even if it was incomplete. By 22, 2022, cities will report confirmed or updated targets and start reporting progress annually. So yeah, before this was open to see the status of cities and now it's going to be developing into a more robust frame. So a process for independently validating the city's targets is currently being developed and will be rolled out this year. So here um, we will be forming a process by which we assess the methods, for example, like the ones I presented to you today. And we also assess the targets of the cities to see that they are a fair shared target. Um, and then we have a continuous process for tracking that this target is being implemented. And this is all from my side. Um, if you have any questions, I don't know, Nicola, how we are going to take them. If now or later, you let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carla, for that session. And certainly I found that very interesting and informative. Uh, we have one question so far in the question and answer section. And if there are any other questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat or in the question and answers box. And um, the one question we've received so far, or well, there's two, the one is um, asking about how these targets are monitored, um, what mechanisms or indicators they are to monitor the targets and how that can be integrated into a municipality's policies and plans. Yes, thanks, Nicola. So um, I think it's precisely that's what, um, what the, the system that is provided by ICLEI. So from uh, the programs that ICLEI has in the in the regional offices, the establishment of, of, of a science-based target with interaction planning and the measures that will help to achieve this target um, with a system of tracking. I think that um, yeah, that is the part that happens at the municipal level. And then we also encourage that this is reported at the international level so that it's showcased in the global initiatives. Great, thank you very much, Carla. And then the second question um, is around how this links to climate change targets that are being set. And I think just from our side, so this is the science-based targets that we've been talking about are specifically for climate change mitigation. So looking at greenhouse gas emission reductions and under the COMSA framework or other climate change action planning that you would have a, a science-based target for climate change mitigation, as well as other targets for climate change adaptation, which would be targets for reducing vulnerability to specific climate hazards and increasing resilience. Um, and then a kind of third question we've got um, is around the reporting. Um, so do around what platforms to report on, and I, you mentioned the CDP ICLE unified reporting system. So if you can just Explain that maybe. Yes, sure. So at the moment, um, together with CDP, we are preparing everything for the launching of reporting cycle this year. And so reporting will be open in April. Um, when exactly that's not yet defined, but from April onwards, cities will be able to report. And here it's where they can report that their targets. That's just one aspect. Um, and here they will be able to report according um, to the race to zero. So there are questions which are marked are for the race to zero. And here they can also report their actions, their action plans, and a lot of climate related data. So there will be webinars on the, on the CDP Clay Unified Reporting System um, cycle of reporting. And yeah, I think just I would say um, we will keep you updated to, so that you can also participate in these webinars on how to report. And yeah, the same approach um, 
I think you will be getting um, support from the regional offices um, and we will be driving this from the from the global level, I would say. But we will be providing all the updates that uh, that is needed to to be reporting. Thank you, Carla. Um, and just to follow on from that, so there are several different reporting platforms available for reporting climate change data. And in, in Africa, certainly, the, I think the most commonly used one is the CDP ECLI Unified Reporting System. We don't, um, there aren't many cities that make use of the other reporting platform. So we would, our recommendation would be to report through the CDP ECLI Unified Reporting System. Um, but I think similarly for other reporting platforms, um, there, there is similar space to, um, to report on these targets. Um, if another question that we have in the question and answer box is, relating to how um, in Africa, in African cities, and this is a challenge we face in many of them, um, we often have limited emissions data um, on greenhouse gas emissions. And so the question is how, how can we get around that to set these science-based targets? And Carla, I'll, I'll open the floor to you for that and then respond as well. Yeah, sure. So uh, my first reaction to that one would be to look at the OPCC because with the OPCC, the city can already say or can already know, okay, for 2030, this is my uh, fair share, according to OPCC, my fair share reduction target. Even if they don't have a greenhouse gas inventory, what they need is the human development index and then, of course, the country of location. So with that, they can calculate um, yeah, what their science-based target is. So as cities advance in, in the process, they when they have their greenhouse gas inventory, they can, yeah, then they can apply that to know the absolute emissions that they will be needing to reduce in 2030. So I think that would be the most straightforward method to use. Thanks, Carla. And then just to add on to that and say that um, as the, the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa, we are in the process of developing tools to make it easier for African cities to develop greenhouse gas inventories. So where there's limited local data, we're developing a, a proxy data tool that helps to fill the gaps based on national and regional data that's available. And so trying to to support our, our signatory cities um, to develop greenhouse gas inventories, even where there's limited data available, and then also support them to develop um, ways of, of improving data availability in the cities. Um, there's another question in, in the chat, which I, I will talk about a bit more later, um, talking about how, about the importance of climate change adaptation, which is something I will get onto um, in the discussion of, of race to resilience and race to zero. Uh, but for now, thank you to everybody who's added questions in the chat. Please continue to do so. If you have questions throughout the presentation and um, Carla will still be available to answer, questions specifically on science-based targets for the rest of the session. Um, and thank you, Carla, very much for this explanation. Um, we will make resources available of the, the guide to science-based targets for cities to participants after the session. Um, and yes, so Carla, thank you very much for your time. Thank um, you very much, Nicola. I'm going to now move on to the next part of our session, um, which is to present the city's race to resilience and city's race to zero um, in African cities. And this is why I say this is linked to the question on adaptation. So, um, and I, I think um, 
Musukisi, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, that you're absolutely right that we need to place equal emphasis on climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation in Africa. And this, so the science-based targets that we've just presented is focused on, on mitigation and setting targets that align with the specific mitigation goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, but we absolutely, as ICLI and, and COMSA, do support climate change adaptation. And, and target setting there. And so um, that brings me on to um, the, the matter of the city's race to zero and race to resilience quite nicely. Um, right, so there are two global initiatives um, that are called the city's race to resilience and city's race to zero. And these are being run really at, at a very much an international level. So they're linked directly to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and they feed into the, the COP conferences, the annual COP conferences, and they're organized by the high level champions, um, which are linked directly to COP and to the UNFCCC. And and organized through a, a partnership of a range of city networks. And the purpose of these is to get, firstly, to showcase ambitious climate action that's happening at the city level globally, and then also to ensure that cities' voices are being heard at this, at the kind of highest international level in climate change negotiations. Um, and so there, there are two initiatives that are bring together cities globally um, to, to voice concerns and, and commitments relating to climate change mitigation, the race to zero, and climate change adaptation, which is the race to resilience. Um, and this, it's really critical that cities are brought into this, this international level of climate change negotiation, um, that it's not only countries that are a part of that, with cities and businesses and other actors as well. Um, and I think, you know, we we say this a lot, but cities are home to, to the majority of the global population now. Um, and not only are they responsible for most of the greenhouse gas emissions and energy use globally, but also particularly in Africa on the, very much on the front lines of the impacts of climate change. Um, so some statistics, 650 million Africans are likely to face urban water shortages due to climate change and over 800 million um, African urban residents, or sorry, global urban residents are likely to face coastal erosion or flooding related to climate change. And so it's really essential that cities are at the, at the front of the action um, and are, are voicing um, and being heard at um, international climate mm -hmm. negotiations. And on top of the climate change thing, cities are suffering the worst impacts from the COVID-19 pan pandemic. And so these two initiatives are, are about climate change front and center, but also thinking through how we come out of COVID and how we, we promote a green and just recovery. Um, so I'm gonna present the two initiatives just highlighting exactly what the city's race to zero and the city's race to resilience are about, each individually, and then talk through um, how to join them. The process for joining them is very similar. Um, so starting with the city's race to zero, which is about climate change mitigation um, and driving a green and just recovery. And um, so this is now the largest coalition of cities and local governments that are committed to reaching the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement. So to achieving the most ambitious international goal that's been set um, and, and leading that process as cities. Um, and so it's a, it's a commitment that cities have been making to reaching net zero emissions by 2050. Um, and both thinking through emissions and how the recovery from COVID can be green and that it's not contributing to causing climate change and just in that it's inclusive and doesn't leave anyone behind. And so this, the city's race to zero is highlighting that, that 
the recovery from COVID and the green and just recovery are led by cities and by mayors. This initiative has been ongoing for a couple of years, and so there are already well over a thousand cities that have pledged to the city's race to zero ahead of COP26, which was in November 2021. And of those 41 are African cities, um, right at the, at the front of being ambitious and undertaking ambitious climate action. Um, and so just to highlight that it is something that African cities are well positioned to join as well. To join the city's race to zero, there's, there's five requirements. And as I'll say again later, these many of these requirements are already being undertaken by this, several of the cities we work with. And so it's not a matter of um, kind of starting the process from scratch again or redoing things that have already been done, but just highlighting and what's already been done and undertaking further action. So the five requirements for the city's race to zero are firstly to endorse, publicly endorse the principles of inclusive climate action. So that means publicly acknowledging as the local government that we are in a global climate emergency and that um, ambitious climate action is important and a priority of the city. The second part of the commitment is a pledge to reach net zero. Um, by mid-century, so 2050 at the latest, so that we can achieve this Paris Agreement target of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. The third part of the commitment is to set a target. So this is very much linked to what we've just been discussing. So to set a science-based target that is consistent with the city's fair share of emissions by 2030. And so this, this is linked to the session we've just had about how to set that target and also linked to the, the CACAP development process under the Covenant of Mayors, which um, my colleague Kate was talking about earlier. Then the fourth part of the pledge is to take action. So this means to implement at least one inclusive climate action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in the pledge form, there's a list of well over 50 actions Many of them are already being investigated by cities or, or implemented by cities in Africa. So that's everything from improving public transport systems to reducing emissions from buildings to improving green open spaces in cities. And then the fifth requirement for this pledge is to report publicly. And so that links very much to what Kyla was talking about with reporting to the CDP ECTI Unified Reporting System, which is one of the public reporting platforms. And so to, to pledge to the city's race to zero, a city has to commit to doing those five actions. Um, and so that's the city's race to zero, and I'll come back um, just now with the details of exactly how to pledge to it. And but for now, I'm going to present the city's race to resilience. And, and like the race to zero, this is also an initiative that's, that's being run through a, a range of partners, as you can see. So ICLI is very much involved in the city's race to resilience and city's race to zero, along with um, a range of other partners. And the race to resilience is about climate change adaptation. So it's about building the resilience of frontline communities who are likely to, ex to experience the most severe impact of climate change and about committing to supporting them to adapt to the impacts of climate change and acknowledging, as, as mentioned earlier, that cities are very much on the front line and likely to expect um, and to experience some of the most severe impacts of climate change, particularly in Africa. And so the importance of, of committing to ambitious climate change adaptation action is, is really front and center. Um, and the, so the Cities Race to Resilience is a newer initiative than the, the Cities Race to Zero, and it started only a few months ago in 2021, but it has been rapidly gaining momentum. So we already have 39 cities that have pledged ahead of COP26 in November, to joining the city's race to resilience, and of those, a third are African. And so we're really seeing African cities kind of coming to the fore in the city's race to resilience. And so we would encourage more to, more to join and to raise the volume of that voice, highlighting the importance of climate change adaptation 
in cities in Africa. Um, and similar to the cities race to zero, there's, there's four requirements um, which are kind of the cor correspond to the cities race to zero. So the first is to pledge to do a risk and vulnerability assessment. Um, and that's a baseline study of how climate change is currently affecting a city and is likely to continue to affect the city and what industries or what sectors are being particularly impacted by different climate hazards. So, for example, does flooding or drought affect agriculture or industry? Um, and then also which population groups or communities are particularly vulnerable to climate change? So the first part of the pledge is undertaking a baseline climate risk and vulnerability assessment. And many of our cities already have or already in that process linked to CAMSA or linked to other initiatives. And so, you know, if, if a city has already done a, a climate risk and vulnerability assessment, there's no need to, to do an, another one that would count as having fulfilled this part of the pledge. Then the second requirement is to set targets for climate change adaptation. Um, and so that would be based on the, the science behind the risk and vulnerability assessment, setting targets for um, increasing the resilience and adapting to climate change of the communities and, and sectors that are identified as vulnerable under the risk and vulnerability assessment. So that's the target setting component. And then the third component is taking action to build resilience. So similar to under the race to zero, which is taking action to reduce emissions, this is taking action to adapt to climate change. And also this can look like many things. So from securing water supply and improving waste management to um, look, looking after green open spaces in the city, there's, there's many different kinds of actions that contribute to climate change adaptation. And finally, then also to report publicly, for example, to the CDP ECLI Unified Reporting System. So those are the requirements for the, the city's race to resilience pledge. And then, as I've, as I've mentioned already, many of the African cities we're working with under CAMSA and under ECLI are already undertaking ambitious climate action. So many of the cities we're working with have already or are in the process of undertaking a risk and vulnerability assessment or setting targets or publicly voicing their acknowledgement and support for inclusive climate action. And many of the actions are already being undertaken. And so we're really encouraging cities that are on their way to undertaking ambitious climate action already to pledge to these initiatives as a way to, to kind of voice what they're doing, voice that it's a priority for them, and to kind of secure their, their commitment internally to undertaking ambitious climate action. So that links very much to this. So there's, I think, kind of two sets of reasons to join. The first is internally, so there's access to resources to and support for planning, climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation. And for example, for setting science-based targets, which we've spoken about today. And then the second is as part of the, the internal commitment. So, you know, pledging to race to zero and or race to resilience is a way to say within your local government that we're committed to climate action and that we need to prioritize it because we've made these international pledges. And then the other reasons are, are kind of external looking. So it's a way to demonstrate on global platforms that your cities are committed to inclusive climate action. Um, and there's lots of media linked, for example, to CUP, to spread um, messages about what your city is doing and to spread lessons learned and best practices that cities have engaged in. And so now I've told you what they are and how, how to, why to join them. And I'm briefly going to give you an overview of how the process of pledging to the city's race to resilience and race to zero works. But just to say at this stage that our team from ICLI and from CAMSA 
are both available to support the process of pledging to the city's race to zero and race to resilience. And so if it's something that you would like to do, we're very happy to walk you through the process. And it can be done online, so through the websites of the city's race to zero and race to resilience, or there also are offline pledge forms, which we can send out with in the follow-up email to the session. Um, and you will go through the pledge as I've talked through the, the different requirements of the two pledges. Um, and then you will need to select a reporting platform. So for example, the CDP Unified Reporting Platform that we've mentioned, that's selecting that platform that you will report on or that you are already reporting on as part of the process of pledging. And then the fifth part of the process is to commit to at least one action. And so both the pledges have a list of over 50 actions that cities may already or be undertaking or planning um, to support their pledges to race to resilience or race to zero. And so as part of the pledge, a city must commit to at least one of those actions, but as many as are relevant. And then finally, it, it needs to be signed either by the mayor or the council leader or by someone within the city who has the authority to sign on behalf of the mayor or the council leader, and then submitted either by email or online. And then the next step is to take action. Um, and so I'm going to pause briefly to to give people an opportunity to ask questions and to answer questions. Um, and then after that, I'm going to just go briefly through some next steps um, of how to, to continue to taking action. Um, I'm just gonna sh stop sharing my screen briefly so that I can see the questions. Just to repeat, if there are any questions on the city's race to zero or race to resilience, then please type them in the chat for the question and answer session section. And also to note, um, which I will touch on just now, that there's now a link to a form in the chat in all three languages um, that you can complete if you're interested in um, having a follow-up directly from us. Um, right, I see there's a question in the chat, which is, if there are currently actions being implemented, climate actions, can these be used for the pledges to cities race to resilience and cities race to zero? And absolutely they can. So if there's already, for example, energy efficiency work going on in the cities, then that can be selected as one of the actions that the city is committed to undertaking under the city's race to zero. And if there's already adaptation actions, so for example, work on securing water sources or similar or coastal protection measures, then those can be used as, as actions under the city's race to resilience. Um, and so as we say, many, many of the cities we work with are already undertaking these kinds of actions. Um, and so this is this is not meant to be a whole a whole workload, a whole new workload. Um, it's supposed to be something that that works off what's already happening in the cities and and is a platform to to commit to that, to continuing that work and also to um, sharing that. Okay, I'm going to just give it another minute or so to see if there's any further questions, and then I will continue with the, the final section of this session. Okay. Um, and then yes, we will, the form that's been posted in the chat, we will share by email as well. Um, as along with the, 
further information about the joining the city's race to zero and race to resilience. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again quickly. Okay, I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the next steps possible. Um, and so this, this covers both what we've been talking about, about the city's race to resilience and race to zero, as well as the information before that on setting science-based targets. Um, and just to note, as, as Kate, my colleague, spoke about earlier on the covenant of introducing the covenant of mayors in sub-Saharan Africa, that is one of the initiatives where we're also supporting ambitious climate action. And through the covenant of mayors in sub-Saharan Africa, Pamsa, we have a technical help desk that provides technical support to signatories, Kamsa signatories. And so one of the ways to kind of take another step in undertaking ambitious climate action is to become a signatory to the Covenant of Mayors if your city isn't already. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly talk through that process. Um, but essentially, Kamsa offers access to training sessions like this one um, and best practices and knowledge exchanges with other cities across Africa. Um, there's also, as, as part of the global covenant of mayors, of which we're the regional covenant, um, there's also opportunities to network with cities across Africa and, and beyond and to join international conferences um, and gain international visibility for your local government and for the climate action um, that you're undertaking. And then also we offer concrete technical support through our technical help desk. Um, and so that technical support includes access to resources and tools that we've developed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're looking at tools to support greenhouse gas inventories and science-based target setting, um, and then also to participate in training courses and webinars, um, and to showcase the best practices and learn from the best practices of other cities. To join um, CAMSA, there's a political commitment form, so joining CAMSA depends um, requires a commitment from your municipal council or the equivalent um, and then that along with the registration form needs to be sent to the help desk at CAMSA. Um, but on the, on the form, the survey that I have sent out, there is a box that you can check on that form for us to contact you about joining CAMSA if that's something that your city is interested in. Um, and always we're, we're available to support through the the help desk. So if you send an email to the help desk at CAMSA, we will respond and, and give you support on joining CAMSA if that's what you require. And then once you've joined, the technical help desk is available to provide support with technical queries. And then the next step is, as Kate mentioned earlier, to undertake a sustainable energy and climate action plan. Um, and so that is that includes climate change mitigation, which is the, the greenhouse gas inventories, the target setting, which we've spoken a lot about today, and action planning, so linked very much to race to zero. And then another pillar of the, the CACAP is climate change adaptation, which involves undertaking a risk and vulnerability assessment, setting targets, and planning adaptation actions. And so that's very much linked to the city's race to resilience. Um, and so we're encouraging CAMSA signatories to also join the city's race to zero and race to resilience because it's very closely aligned with the commitment to develop a CACAP. And that's something that we can support CAMSA signatories with through the technical help desk. Um, and then once cities have developed a CACAP, the next step is like with the city's race to resilience and race to zero to then report on progress. And then just to, to briefly go through, so this is a, an outline of the kinds of technical support that we can provide to CAMSA signatories through the technical help desk. Um, so as, as I've just been talking about, the first one is political commitment, so supporting cities to join CAMSA. 
And then we can also provide more technical support on developing a, a sustainable energy access and climate action plan, including baseline reporting, so undertaking a risk and vulnerability assessment or a greenhouse gas inventory, setting targets as we've spoken about today, and then also planning actions. Um, and we also provide support to cities around project development for climate action projects um, and project implementation. So that's a very brief overview of the kinds of support available through the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa. And all of those for Comsa signatories can be accessed through the technical help desk. Um, and so I'm just gonna, sorry, pull up the last slide because that is the email address for the technical help desk, um, which is helpdesk at comsa.org. Um, and I think that will also be in the chat. Um, and then just to say that, as Kate mentioned earlier, Kamsa is has over 15 partners and is funded um, by the European Commission and the um, BMZ and ACID. And so we're very grateful for their support in for this webinar and training session today, as well as to ICLI World Secretariat and Kyla for providing the training on science-based targets. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to any further questions, and if there aren't any, then we will close the webinar. Right, I'm not seeing any additional questions. I'm just going to give it another minute um, and to say thank you very much to everyone for making time to join us today. Um, we appreciate your time and we hope that it's been instructive. And if you need any further support, um, that you will be able to contact us. We will be sending a follow up email with some of the information that we've mentioned. And finally, thank you. Once again to Kate and to Carla, thank you very much for joining. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.